Welcome back to the program. Our next guest is News Corp's Chief Communications Officer, Jim Kennedy. He's had a front row seat to history. His distinguished career took him to the Clinton White House, where he served as the President's Deputy Assistant, Deputy Press Secretary and Senior Advisor to the White House Council. During Bill Clinton's impeachment inquiry, Jim Kennedy spoke on behalf of the embattled White House, receiving up to 70 media inquiries daily and articulating the president's position at a time of significant scrutiny. Right now we're reaching out to members of Congress and to members of the public to make our basic point that these allegations do not rise to the level of an impeachable offence as set forth in the Constitution of the United States and that the will of the people should be listened to. And, and we believe that has been shown quite clearly to be against impeachment, against resignation. In 2000, Jim Kennedy became Al Gore's communications director in the White House while the vice president waged his presidential campaign against George Bush. The 2000 US election was one of the closest in history. Al Gore won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College with just 537 votes in Florida, the difference. After a protracted process in the US courts, Al Gore conceded more than a month after election day and he used Jim Kennedy's office phone to make that historic phone call to George Bush just before addressing the nation. Good evening. Just moments ago, I spoke with George W. Bush and congratulated him on becoming the 43rd president of the United States. And I promised him that I wouldn't call him back this time. A month after that concession, Al Gore took to the rostrum of the House to certify the controversial election result. Jim Kennedy suggested via BlackBerry that Vice President Gore conclude his remarks with this phrase. Advice you'll see he followed nearly word for word. May God bless our new president and our new vice president and may God bless the United States of America. Jim Kennedy later became Hillary Clinton's head of communications when she was a New York senator. He worked closely with Senator Clinton on her response to the 9-11 terror attacks as she successfully campaigned for billions in recovery and development funds. He visited Ground Zero in the days after the Twin Towers falling and took this video. Post-politics, Jim Kennedy worked for Sony Pictures and Sony Corporation for several years before joining News Corp as its Chief Communications Officer in 2013. He also was a volunteer advisor in Hillary Clinton's 2008 and 2016 presidential campaigns. And I'm pleased to say that Jim Kennedy joins me live now from our newsroom in Sydney. Jim, thank you so much for your time. You know the political race in a way few others do. What factors in the United States do you believe will decide this year's election between, at this stage anyway, Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that early voting is going to start happening in September, as early as September 20th. And in some key states like uh, uh, New Mexico and Arizona, it's going to start on October 8th and October 9th. So a lot of votes are going to start being cast in October, and that could have a dramatic effect on the election. But more than that, we need to look at the uh, issues of the personal health of both candidates, given their age, as well as the health of the economy, which is going to play a role in people's decisions. And also the immig immigration issue, which is really looming large in, in uh, 2024, that's going to be a factor, as well as the legal issues surrounding Donald Trump. So there's going to be some kind of alchemy of all those issues that are going to be stewing in people's brains as they go to vote this fall. And, and as you look at the, the campaign, which is well and truly up and running now between these two presumptive nominees, what, what campaign advice would you be giving to each of them? Well, a, a co-worker of mine, uh, Doug Sosnick, is, is a wise observer and recently said that this campaign, if it's a referendum on Donald Trump, then Joe Biden's going to win. And if it's a referendum on Joe Biden, then Donald Trump's going to win. So I think each candidate is going to try to make the other candidate the issue, but you cannot only wage a, a negative campaign. So I would say to Joe Biden, I would say, uh, don't do the basement strategy again from 2020. Get out there, get out there in public, uh, in town hall settings, in rallies, 
Uh, he draws energy from crowds and show that he has the vitality and, and, the, and the optimism to, to be a great president. Uh, so that would be his mission. Uh, and don't demonize uh, the, all the opponents of uh, all the supporters of your opponent. You can criticize Donald Trump, but don't criticize the people who support him because you want to be president of all the people. I think it's important for him to have that in mind. And don't be afraid to, uh, to take a, a more conservative position on immigration, maybe offend some on the left of the party. But with every vote you may lose on the left, you can gain a couple in the middle, which is where he needs to go to, to get a majority of support. And I think for uh, the mission for uh, Donald Trump really is the, to borrow the old Bill Clinton campaign song, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. And do stop thinking about 2020 and January 6th and don't obsess about either that or the legal issues he's confronting. But focus instead on issues like personal secur uh, security for Americans, national security for the country, and economic opportunity for all people. If he approaches that in a positive way um, and looks to the future, that would benefit him. What are the, the key issues that Americans will base their vote upon? I know you spoke about the, the mix of issues whirling around at the moment in the political debate. So often we hear in the United States, in Australia too for that matter, it's all about the economy. Is that how you see things in 2024? Well, the economy is always an issue. It either works to the benefit of the incumbent if the economy is doing well uh, or to the detriment of the incumbent if it's, if it's doing poorly. And it, it is going to be an issue, particularly because of inflation. People, uh, the inflation rate is slowing. There, is, there are signs of progress. On the other hand, prices are still high, so people feel confronted by that. And so that's going to continue to be an issue. But I would say this year, more than others, immigration has risen. It certainly was an issue in 2016, which benefited Donald Trump. Uh, but but it's even more prevalent of an issue this year because people see it with their own eyes in many of their communities around the country. And so that's going to be a factor. There's, there are other issues, of course. Crime is, is, is always an issue. There could be some marginal impact from the war in Gaza, in Michigan, for example, which could be uh, affect uh, Joe Biden's results there. Uh, abortion may be an issue in those states which have a referendum on the topic. Uh, but, but I think overall, the economy and immigration are probably the top two issues, as well as the, uh, the health status of the candidates themselves. I hope they both are, remain yeah, so very healthy, but, but that's going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. on, on that health status, I, I just wonder about the impact that Kamala Harris has on this, given, well, particularly Joe Biden, 81, and he's four years older than Reagan was when he left office. So does the vice president factor in here in terms of deliberations for voters? Yeah, I think this year, more than most, the, the, the VP candidate for both candidates is going to be more important than in the past. In, the, in, in Years ago, sometimes they would pick vice presidents because of which state they were from in hopes of getting the electoral votes from that state, for example, Lyndon Johnson in 1960. But by and large, most of the VP candidates did not play a big role in the outcome. But this year, because of the age of each of the candidates, uh, the, the, who the people are as running as vice president is going to be a factor and discussed more often uh, than, than in the past. And that's why a lot of eyes are on Donald Trump in terms of who he is going to choose for his VP. Indeed. Now, it's obviously notoriously difficult to predict this next thing, but I do want to ask you about, and I know you've spoken about this before, the impact of X factors, uh, X factors in a presidential election year. Talk us through your thinking on potential for X factors in this presidential race. Sure. The nature of an X factor is you can't predict what it's going to be, but you can predict something may happen. For going back to 1980, for example, the Iranian hostage crisis uh, certainly was an X factor that impacted that election uh, in uh, in the year 2000. You know, you had the the coal bombing uh, as well, and and in in uh, 2016, you had both the Access Hollywood tape and uh, and the email issues for Hillary Clinton. Uh, uh, that that was a factor. And in 2020, of course, was COVID, one of the biggest X factors of all time. So th those all uh, were were factors in the past. And in terms of what's going to happen this year. Um, if you if either candidate had a medical emergency, that would certainly be a crisis of major proportions uh, or if America experienced a natural disaster or, for example, the, the terror attack that happened in Russia recently, uh, a, t a terrible tragedy. If that had happened in America, that would have huge political repercussions or if there's a major cyber incident that affects stock markets or air travel. 
uh, that would have consequences. And, and so we, we don't quite know what may occur between now and October, November, but we certainly can expect the unexpected. Some of the iconic moments in a presidential election have been the debates. Will there be debates this year? My bet right now is that there will not be debates, in part because I think, uh, I don't know, but I, I think the, 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 the Biden campaign uh, may be reluctant to put him in a position where there is such high risk involved, where if, if he didn't perform at a great level, then it would be a huge problem very late in the game. The State of the Union was a high-profile event. I think he did quite well in that setting. Uh, but, you know, what really counts is how people think about this in October. And so they'll have to make a decision. If, they're, if the, President Biden remains behind in the key battleground states as he is now, they may decide to take that risk and, and, and push forward with a debate. But, but they may decide not to, in which case there would not be a debate. Uh, but there certainly have been decisive moments in the past uh, in debates, going back to Kennedy and Nixon in 1960. In 1976, Gerald Ford, for example, uh, talked about Poland not being under Soviet domination. That certainly had an impact in, in that uh, campaign. In, in 1992, in the debate, George Bush uh, was looking at his watch, suggesting he was bored or disengaged, and that, that hurt him. In the year 2000, Al Gore uh, famously sighed and, and was confrontational in the debate, and that became an issue. Um, and so uh, these debates can, can have a big impact. And the other question to consider is whether there'd be a third party on the debate stage. For example, if Robert F. Kennedy Jr. were on the debate stage, it would certainly be, uh, be a huge and enormous uh, uh, impact on how people talked about it, and perhaps on votes. And, and finally, we've alluded to this throughout the discussion today. What happens, though, if either candidate fails to make election day itself? There are pr procedures in place for a, a candidate to, who has to, you know, unfortunately come off the ballot for one reason or another. Uh, and it sort of depends on when at that happens. For example, if, if it were to happen sooner, uh, then the, obviously the delegates have been largely chosen and so they could still meet in convention and then basically have an open convention and decide who the candidate's going to be. If it had to happen after the convention, uh, each party has its own process where the DNC or the RNC would itself choose the candidate or in the case of the RNC, as I understand that they could call for another convention. But it certainly would be a, a chaotic moment, moment. I do recall in 1968, uh, it was uh, at this time in 1968, Lyndon Johnson was still a candidate and it was on March 30th of that year that he decided not to run. But there hasn't been much precedent otherwise for, for a dramatic change in an election year. The closest I can remember is a, a vice presidential candidate, Thomas Eagleton, had to come off the ticket or did come off the ticket in 1972, a couple weeks after the convention. He was going to be uh, George McGovern's uh, running mate, uh, uh, but uh, he was replaced by Sergeant Shriver. But that was the VP level, so it was certainly a big story at the time, but not decisive. Jim Kennedy, I very much appreciate your time. I look forward to it and I hope we can have another chat closer to Election Day. Thanks so much. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you.